Welcome to this edition of Parallax Views, an IEA series of conversations about cultural affairs, particularly focusing on the issue of free speech. My name is Mark Lindenning, and today I'm joined by Dr. Philip Kessely, uh, who is a lecturer in performance and cultural uh, histories at Leeds University. He is an expert in fields as diverse as American noir, crime literature, punk rock, and 1970s uh, British television. Um, our conversation today is going to focus on his documentary film, The War on Our History, uh, which has been put out by the New Culture Forum um, under its Heresies series. Uh, it's a truly fascinating piece of work, which I can't recommend highly enough to you if you want to get a greater understanding of what is underlying the culture war uh, that Britain and other uh, nations in the Anglosphere are now experiencing. Um, it's topical that we're having this conversation today because um, the Times newspaper reported this morning that a number of universities have drawn up blacklists of books, uh, which has a sort of overtone really of the, of the uh, cultural uh, revolution. And Philip and I are going to be returning uh, to that specific issue um, because it relates very directly to the content of the film he has made. Um, in, your doc in your documentary, you refer to the origins of the way in which British history has become politically weaponized mm. and our culture drained of meaning, mm. to use the, the phrase you, you uh, employ from Kierkegaard. Uh, you refer to the emergence of the first British New Left, Raymond Williams, E.P. Thompson, those kind of people. Mm. And then you go on to mention the advent of the angry young men, kitchen sink drama, the way in which from the late 1950s onwards, there was a growing focus on northern working class life. Um, is there not an argument for saying that far from being manifestations of new left ideology, films like Room at the Top, This Sporting Life, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, and so on, should rather be seen as giving expression to a new individualistic ethos. Yeah, I, I think so very much. They're about individuals breaking out of the, the, the shackles of essentially um, terraced rows of houses and drab uh, lives and, and soul-destroying jobs, aren't they? And, and so they, I, I look at those films and in a way I kind of think about the Thatcher era of the 1980s, the, there isn't a huge amount of difference in, in terms of the ethos, that idea that you can, you know, you can move, you can have social mobility, you can buy your own council house, you can, you can do all of these things. All of a sudden, it's possible. It's quite ironic because it comes from an absolute leftist, neo-Marxist, like you say, E.P. Thompson, Raymond Williams and all of those people. But I think it, it highlights the difference between aspects of the left then and aspects of the left now. And I think there was a genuine, or there wasn't really a huge amount of um, intellectual energy from the right at that time. This is the end of the war, this is post-empire. Um, and it's not only me that would say that. The, the late, great Roger Scruton said that it was all of the intellectual energy was, was, was from the left at this time. And some of it was good and some of it was not so good. I think he looked at 1968 in particular and thought, well, you know, I, I need to think differently and I need to present a different paradigm. But I agree with you completely, Mark, in the sense that this is about breaking out and this is about uh, creating a, a, a different kind of society. And one of the reasons I'm interested in that stuff is because I see myself in that stuff. I'm from a, a, a working class background. I'm from Bury um, in Manchester, and I'm the first person of my family to go to university. I'm the first person to write a book, and so on and so forth. So I, 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 I see that social mobility in myself. And what strikes me um, about that first sort of cultural revolution or post-war cultural revolution is that it was 
very sort of positive mm. and progressive uh, in feel. I mean, it was completely different to the sort of sour, unpleasant nihilism of contemporary mm. uh, leftist culture. Mm. Totally different. I was, I was thinking. Actually, I just come down on the train, and I, I was thinking about the. Uh, I was thinking about the film. I was thinking, oh, I should have watched it again. Really, um, I was thinking, when did that happen? When did that take place? When did it become? so um, sour and horrible and vindictive and nasty. Um, and I think it's around about the time that identity politics really took hold and, and came out of um, the, the institutions, the universities, and became mainstream, I think. So I think we're talking about the last. I've been aware of a real hatred, I suppose, towards people like me. It used to be that, you know, people, uh, lots of people from the left, not I've got very close friends of, with people from the left, and, and as, as I say, you know, lots of my ideas chime with, 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 with left ideology, but a lot of them don't. And it used to be you'd have a really good argument, and there was always a sense of, you know, you know evil Tories, Tory scum, and all of that kind of thing. But it wasn't what it is now and now there's, there's a sense of if you disagree with the I identitarian orthodoxy you're not just wrong you're evil and i think that's the difference and and if people can characterize you as evil then they can behave in any way they want and and that's the difference between then and now i think uh, viewers might disagree on when this happened because it's been happening since the 60s, but I think it's really gained pace over this last 10 years or so. Um, in the film, you make reference to postmodernism yeah. uh, as being uh, very significant in this, um, in this war on our, on our history um, and the development of the sort of very unpleasant identity politics, which is, which is now so prevalent. Um, w w could you elaborate on that? I, I thought, again, a few years ago, something's happening here where we'd gone through all of these struggles, these societal struggles, these cultural struggles, political struggles, and we'd, we'd come to somewhere, Douglas Murray talks about this very eloquently, actually. We'd come to somewhere where we were kind of okay. There was a kind of reasonable kind of coherence as a society and people didn't, there was racism, of course there was, and there was sexism and all of that kind of thing. But but generally speaking, the culture didn't really revolve around those things. And, and it seemed to be as though we were getting to a place that was pretty good. And then all of a sudden, it just went crazy. And I think it's with the advent of social media is, is, is one of those things. But it seemed to me that it wasn't enough to be equal. The identitarians wanted to be better in some way. So it wasn't enough to be equal with a white heterosexual able-bodied man. You had to be better. And, and of course you were better, you know. And it wasn't enough to, to, to have that level playing field. You, you needed to make the white heterosexual able-bodied man guilty. Really, really guilty. And that kind of, what happened was, I think that history started being weaponized to support those agendas. And, and I sound like I'm, I'm being really crazy. I, I'm, I'm honestly not. You know, I think history was being weaponized to support those agendas. So now we, we don't really think about um, the good things that happened in history. You know, we, we don't think about the legalization of homosexuality. We don't think about the Race Relations Act. All of these things that happened in the 60s that helped even up things. We go right back to Colston. We go right back to you know the 18th century. We go right back to slavery, and not the abolition of slavery, and, and all of the you know thousands of mm. Royal Navy men that, that died on on the high seas trying to you know police the abolition of slavery. No, it's just half of the story. It's slavery. It's wickedness. It's ancestral sin. Um, I interview. Um, Calvin Robinson in the film, and he talks about this idea of ancestral sin, and of course you can't expunge it, you can't get rid of it, it's there, and no matter what, you know. So I think that idea of weaponizing history 
is all about just pushing very simple agendas and very pressing agendas and, and, and history is the best way in which to do that. So the, the, the sort of the left have had, or the contemporary left, not <coughs> the sort of old, decent social democratic left, but the, the new left have had to go down a sort of time tunnel mm. in order to justify and facilitate their sort of grievance yeah. mongering and their attempt to create oppressor and victim categories, which in reality in this society don't exist no. because, you know, Britain has never been no. apartheid South Africa or, you know, the southern states of America in the 1950s. So th they're, they're having to, in order to impose this ancestral sin on you and me and anybody who happens to, to just to so happens to have pale coloured skin, mm. um, they're having to, to go down a time tunnel. Mm. And it's interesting as well because not, not only are they going down a time tunnel, if they were going down a time tunnel and exploring history in a holistic, interesting way, that would be fine, you know, because you know, there are aspects to our history that are, that are terrible, but there are lots of aspects to our history that are wonderful as well. But one of the things they do is, is they go just looking for certain things. It's almost like they've got a lens and, and, and that can pick up uh, racism you know, that can pick up sexism. And, and that's all they look at. So they're going through this vast, complex landscape and they're picking out these little things. And they say, well, there you go, that, that represents everything, that represents everything, that represents everything. And that's their way of looking at history. And, and it's through these kind of, you know, critical lenses. So feminism, post-colonialism and all of that kind of stuff. And they're very helpful, you know, it's, it's no good to look at history and, and, and completely ignore the bad stuff. But if you- well, Nobody's suggesting that, but nobody, nobody's suggesting I mean, that. Who, who is actually arguing but, for that? But nobody's suggesting yeah. that. But, but if you only mm. look at the bad stuff and you don't look at anything else, or actually, it's not even the bad stuff. It's stuff that you impose a, an agenda that was created yesterday onto it. You know, So you can't... The, the trans thing is a really good example of that. You can't expect 19th century Britain to be up on trans issues because <laughs> they didn't exist. But but this is the thing, isn't it? You know, oh my God, they were transphobic. You know, the, 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 William Ewart uh, Gladstone, oh, yeah, so so transphobic, was, Israeli yeah. transphobic. My yeah, God, you know. Yeah. So we've got to cancel them. Yeah. So uh, that's how it works, and it sounds so ridiculous when you actually say it for what it is. But it's a process that's always going on, you know. So it's this, this idea, well, we're looking at this particular thing, we're looking at the, the effect of the marginalisation of gay people, and we're looking at this, and we're looking at that. And so it becomes a big area, a, a kind of studies, and that's all you ever look at, and that's how it works. Um, going back to the, the story I mentioned uh, in, in the Times today about all these universities, uh, now drawing up blacklists yeah. of books uh, that they want, they don't want their students to have access uh, to. I mean, that's self-evidently incredibly sinister. But it seems to me what is going on here, going back to postmodernism, is that um, our understanding of what constitutes power, mm. the exercise of power, mm. and therefore what constitutes harm, mm. and therefore what constitutes safety, as mm. in safe spaces, um, has its origins in this postmodernist assertion, uh, following on from Foucault and mm. Derrida, mm. who you mentioned in, in the film, um, their argument that language can be a potential form of coercion, mm. as if it were physical violence. Mm. And if you go down that road, then presumably this gives the academic left elite license to ban anything they want, which is what they're now doing. But they're doing it in a kind of using rather facile and banal justifications for doing it rather than being explicitly authoritarian. Mm. They're banning it because it's good for you. It's, it, you know, this, this will harm you. This will harm your well-being. It's actually, it's framed, it's what, it's what Frank Ferreira calls the culture of fear, isn't it? And it's framed in all of this medical, uh, psychological mm. uh, gobbledygook. You know, this, this, this stuff will harm you. And, and, and if, you, if you're exposed to it, oh, you'll be harmed. I think there's a, it, it works on several 
layers. I think one of the layers is that we've turned, through postmodernism, we, we've turned everything upside down. So facts and reality are objective reality and facts now are bad. It's as simple as that, they are bad, you know, so we don't deal with them. Reality has become what you feel. That's the most real thing you can possibly have. So if I feel kind of feminine today and I feel that I'm a, I'm a woman, then Mark, I'm a woman. And if you don't think that I'm a woman, then that's going to harm me massively. So the idea of the subjective becoming everything and subjective becoming real is actually quite frightening because what it does is it separates us and it gives us a kind of mm. almost an existential angst because we can't communicate with other with each other. If you're terrified of, of offending my, my subjective reality and you've got no idea really what my subjective reality is, what are you going to do? It's going to be a massive barrier between us and we're not going to be able to communicate as human beings, are we? And I think that's what's happening in the, in the, in the broader culture. So if something is some, you know, Shakespeare, for example, if, 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 if that is offensive to me, then following that logic, it's perfectly okay to ban it because the, the most important thing is not a kind of objective reality and a broader view of things. You know, that, that, that text will help us because it's a historical text and it talks poetically about society and culture. No, it harms me and the only important thing is not even me, it's my subjective view of myself. But of course, this is very asymmetrically applied. Yeah. So you say it's, it's, by definition, highly subjectivist. I would say almost to the point, well, I would say to the point of madness yeah. with regards to uh, transgenderism. Mm. But of course, um, the subjective feelings of people who, for example, do not share mm. uh, the same uh, paradigm of thought, say somebody like J.K. Rowling, mm their subjective feelings stroke rights can be totally trampled upon. Totally. They can be prosecuted, the police can turn up to check up on their thinking and all of all of that sort of horror we've been we've been seeing in in recent times of people being put on databases by the, the cops and so on and so forth. So it it's not as if it was uh, an equally applied an um, anarchistic subjectivism, it's actually, again, a group-based yeah. form of privilege yeah. that some groups get to say, I am this, I am that, fair enough, you can say whatever you want to about yourself. But those people who don't share those beliefs, who refuse to recognize mm. them, mm. while respecting the right of the others to say what they, whatever they want to say, they can go to jail. Oh, they can, can be jail. banned from speaking at universities. They can be have their careers destroyed. Yeah, I mean, the, the, their you know, by, by contrast, their feelings are manifest evidence of their wickedness. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's true. Yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, so yeah, if yeah, I yeah. feel pretty, oh <laughs> God, you know, I feel, I feel, I feel terrible here, and and you know, it's just manifest. I'm, I'm, I'm wicked. I'm evil, and and that's what yeah. it is. So it works in. Uh, in, in, in these, and I, this is not to suggest that I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian, and, and if, if someone wants to wear a dress and call you, I'm, of course, I'm nobody's, perfectly nobody's fine nobody's with saying that. they shouldn't so be allowed to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. but what, 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 what I don't want to be forced into doing is forced into believing that they are something that they are manifestly not. And that's what's happening. It's not just a sense of, oh, well, we're doing this, and so if, if you would kind of go, no, it's, if you don't believe it, then you are the problem. If you don't buy this subjectivity, not just go along with it for politeness, if you don't believe it, then you are the real problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, hey, we need a word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this brings me on to the question of, the the essence, the nature of the contemporary left, which I, I like to refer to as the, the culture control left. Mm. Um, and my 
belief, and you may think this is overstated, that what we're seeing is the emergence of a highly authoritarian anti-liberal movement. I mean, for example, in the film you have various quotes you flag up, including one by Priam Vada Gobel, who's yeah, a, yeah, this an academic, and she says, Cambridge, for example, uh, This is a Cambridge academic. Oh, is she a Cambridge, Cambridge professor? Right. Yeah. And she says, now we have the opportunity to carry out a resolute offensive against the whites, break their resistance, eliminate them as a class, and replace their livelihoods. I resist the urge to kneecap white men. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful to hear that she does. I think extremely grateful as well. Um, but this is sort of extraordinary stuff, isn't it? I mean, and then here's a quote from Nadia Whittam, who's a Labour MP. We must not fetishize debate as though debate is itself an innocuous neutral act. Mm. The very act of debate in these cases is an effective rollback of assumed equality and a foot in the door for doubt and hatred. Well, the logic of this is that the greater, the more censorship there is, mm -hmm. the more liberated mm -hmm. the society comes becomes. Don't you think there's a logic now within new left thinking through this postmodernist theory of language, which sees language as oppressive, mm -hmm. and also then the identity politics paradigm, which casts certain groups of people as oppressors mm -hmm. and others as victims, that this is actually leading towards a sort of proto-fascistic kind of movement, a bit the sort of friends and enemies idea that was uh, propagated by Carl Schmidt, who was a, a Nazi mm -hmm. theorist mm -hmm. of jurisprudence. This is identitarian. This is totally against the whole notion of, I mean, the, the basis of Western liberalism, which is to see the individual as the primary unit of social analysis and respect. I, th I think what's happening is there's a, there's, a, there's a push for social, cultural, political hierarchies. And... and and, and it's a complete inversion, I suppose, of, of what it used to be 200 years ago. And they just want completely the opposite. And, and I think they're very, they're actually very honest about it. They don't want equality. They want better. You know, they, they want a sense of uh, these people up here and, 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 and these people down here. I say they're, they're, they're honest about it. I, th I think they are in some of the writings, but they're, they're probably not in, in the everyday scheme of things. So the, the identitarian left always characterise themselves as somehow being rebellious, as somehow being, you know, um, outside of things and, 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 and you, know, do, you know, throwing grenades in. And, uh, they're not. They're absolutely the cultural, political establishment. They're completely the establishment. Mm -hmm. If you think everything that the major Russell Group universities think, if you think everything that the BBC thinks, if you think everything that, that Google thinks, if you're walking around with rainbow flags and, and BLM uh, regalia and, uh, and all the rest of it, you are absolutely part of the establishment. That is the establishment. You're not in any way, shape or form rebellious. You're just imposing this this ideology on everybody else and 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 I, to, to answer your question do do, do I do I think you're, you're overstating it no I don't I really don't because it's an author it's, it's an orthodoxy that has taken over all of um, all of the institutions and I'll just give you an example that that I saw a couple of days ago it was an image and I don't know whether uh, viewers have seen it apparently the image has been around quite a while but it was a, an image it, uh, taken at a, a, a pride rally of a couple of uh, a policeman and a policewoman with these two people dressed as leather 
uh, dogs, you know, on gimp the, dogs. Gimp, that, that's the word specific. <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for. So, gimp dogs. You sounded a bit like a high court judge who hasn't, you know, has, I was, I was, is I not was familiar the, with the concept I, of a sex doll. I, I, and, and, uh, and, and, my, and my sneering. I was the judge at the Jeremy <laughs> Thorpe trial. That was it. Um, but um, uh, so uh, I don't know if you've seen the, you've seen the image. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you were because you were smiling. But yeah. viewers might have seen the image as well, and maybe we can put it in the comments. I don't know. But um, what you see there is the police completely captured by an, a, a, you know, an orthodoxy, by an ideology that loathes them and everything they're supposed to stand for. If you look at the two, you know, if you do a textual analysis of the image, you look at the two, the, the policeman and the policewoman, they're so uncomfortable, they're not in, because these are the police, they're not in control. The gimp dogs, as you eloquently put it, the gimp dogs there are completely in control of that scenario. And for me, that sums up where we are. Uh, which is a very uncomfortable place for those of us who, I think, have, have liberal values. Um, but you end your documentary on a, a sort of rather positive note uh, in terms of what you think people should try and do about this. Yeah. So I was wondering if you would care to end our conversation by telling us what you think we should do well, yeah, in response to I, this kind of cultural authoritarianism and experiencing. I, I, I think there are a few ways you can look at this. I, th I think you can, you, you can fight back and there are, and there are lots of mechanisms to, to fight back against, against this stuff and social media for all its ills is also very good for us. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing this on YouTube now, so this is very good and we can say pretty much what we want. What we want. There are two ways of looking at it. You can take either the kind of the classic, what I call the Peter Hitchens view, which is it's all finished, it's all over, you know, let's, let's go on a boat and go somewhere else because it's, it's completely finished. I, I, on my, you know, on my on my worst days, I think that, but I I, I don't necessarily think that in, in the ordinary scheme of things. I, I think I think we should be fighting back against an illiberal kind of fascistic or authoritarian um, establishment, and I think we can do that in certain ways. Um, can we take back the institutions? I don't know whether we should be thinking about taking back the institutions more, I think we should be creating new institutions. And that's what I say at the end of the film. So new um, educational, it's, it's it, in a way it's kind of Burke's little platoons as well. So we should be, we, we should be really um, thinking about preserving properly communities, you know, family, and if people are religious, and the, the, the church and things like that, the pillars of communities. I think that's getting offline and getting back into real life is one major thing we should do. But also it's creating new institutions, so it's not really trying to kind of bring Cambridge back. I mean, it's so appalling that I'm saying that, but I think Cambridge is completely lost, for example. You know, um, it's not about trying to bring Cambridge back from the brink because it's toppled over a long time ago. It's about creating new universities, new institutions, uh, places like Buckingham, for example. I think Buckingham is a really, really good example of something, a, a, an educational institution that's doing something right. And and I think it's it's about um, it's about understanding what's going on as well. I think I think people um, of the old left and 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 people of the right of centre conservatives think often think oh it's political correctness gone mad oh it's just stupid it's 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 you know let's just forget about it let's not engage with it no you've got to engage with it you've really got to understand it because once you engage with it and understand it you know how deep and insidious it is you know and if you can do that then you can properly fight back on the appropriate intellectual and emotional level as well and and really state a case that is you know, that, that is sensible. And, and that's not to say, again, I say in the film, you know, don't go online looking for arguments with anarchists because you might as well just talk to the cat, you know, it's pointless. But if you can, if you can kind of push back against the tide in a sensible way, then at least you'll feel better about yourself. Mm. And I liked your reference to encouraging people simply to read. 
yeah. uh, and to read books. Mm. Um, it, to me, it had a slight overtone, or it reminded me slightly of a, a political science fiction film from the late 60s called Fahrenheit 451, yeah. where the sort of fascistic regime has banned mm. books mm. And, um, uh, and indeed burns them. Um, and that's what the, the sort of fire brigade in that era is, is really about. Uh, and so people then memorize mm. books mm. as an act of subversion, God, but also I mean, such an act image. of such you know, personal salvation. It's a, it's so I, I like that, that reference. Well, I think it, it, it's not just about, that's generally about society. People don't tend to take time out to immerse themselves in the complexity of ideas um, because we live in such a, you know, we, we, we have sound bites, you know, we live in a Twitter world. Uh, it's, if it doesn't catch, capture our attention in, in 30 seconds, then we're not going to deal with it. You know, so I was, I was talking about uh, popular music in particular uh, and, and, and how popular music has just been reduced, 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 reduced because... Um, um, the, it, it, we don't sit down and listen to albums anymore. We just listen to songs on a on a on a, on a loop, don't we? Um, so the idea of sitting down with a book and then immersing yourself in complex ideas is something we should we should embrace again uh, because that's how we push back on this stuff. Well, that's a great note on, on which to end. F Philip, thank you so much for, Thanks, for Thanks. joining me. Thank you for watching. And um, I really urge you, if you haven't seen it already, uh, to see uh, The War on Our History by Philip Kessley, uh, which has been put out by the very excellent New Culture Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.